We're looking at people who won't preach on sin or hell because it leaves negative connotations. Is that the church that God designed? Is that the church that God wants? No. But it's the day and age that we're living in. When we look around, all we see is doom and gloom. And if we look at even the world, does the world recognize that we are living in a horrible, horrible day? Does the world look for the end of the world as we know of it? Well, you say no, sir. What's that? The world. We do. We do, but at the same time, I would say the world does too. And this is where I'm coming from. How many end of the world movies are there out there? How many people flock to see the end of the world movies? How many people are crying? We need to stop global warming, otherwise we're going to flood everything. How many people are crying about overpopulation? We need to cut back because there are too many people on the earth as we know of it. You know, the, even the world we're living in recognizes that we are living in a perilous time. And if we look at America, 1950 versus uh, 2019, how has the world changed? It's changed drastically. Where once everybody went to church, or at least everybody knew of God, or the things of God, or even simple Bible stories, people don't even know those anymore. Or those that, well, let me just leave it with that. But we are living in a day and age like none other. People don't go to church anymore. We are living in a day and age where things that go against the Bible are occurring in the church. Homosexuals being ministers. Not just being on the platform, but homosexuals being actual ministers. I mean, we are living a day and age like none other. But how should we, as Christians, perceive this? And I'm trying not to leave my notes as far as I want to leave my notes. But we are living in what I will classify as one of the darkest times of humanity. I think we can all uh, agree with that one. We can go back to the statement of Jesus Christ. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be when the coming of the Son of Man is. And what was happening in the days of Noah? We can talk about all the wickedness, how their hearts were continually wicked. But we can also talk about how they were eating and drinking. And when we were looking at those perspectives, they were going about everyday life, never looking for the return or looking for hope. They were focused on down here and not up there. Is that not the day and age that we're living in? Even the church is fixated on what's going on down here, and we're not watching for Jesus Christ to come back. We've got our eyes off the eastern sky. But in the spite of everything else, we are the light of the world. What does John chapter 8 and verse 12 state? John 8, 12. And also someone else get Matthew 5, 14. John 8, 12 and Matthew 5, 14. John 8, 12, do you have that? And speak Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not, have, shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So who is the light of the world and mentioned in John? Jesus. Jesus. What does Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14 state? You know the light of the world, the city that is set on the hill, and not be hidden. So we are the light of the world. So why are we the light of the world? There's only one reason we are the light of the world. And we have to go right back to John. Because the church is supposed to be a reflection of Jesus Christ. And if you don't have Jesus, you don't have the light. But the true church is the light of the world because she has the light of Christ. If that church does not have the light of the Christ, light of Christ, then what do we have? We have the darkness of this world. We cannot have both. You cannot have the light of Christ and the darkness of the world. It does not work. You're either going to be full of darkness, or your eyes going to be full of light. The Bible says that we are the light of the world. The only reason we are the light of the world is because of Jesus. And what happens with a light? We said we are living in the darkest times. 
if we have a room full of light and we lit a candle up here, how noticeable would it be? <coughs> it might be a little bit noticeable. We could see the flame. We'd recognize it. But how much more would we recognize it if we turned off all the lights? And how much more would we recognize it the darker and darker God in this place? We are living in one of the darkest times of history that the world has ever known. We are living in a time of great apostasy. We are living in a time when if we were not careful, even those who are studying and know the word of God inside and out, the Bible says the very elect would be deceived if they're not careful. That's the time we're living in. If the true church arises and they really have the light of Christ, how much brighter are we going to shine in this present time? Yes, we are living in a time that we can cry doom, gloom, and despair. But what does the Word of God state in Joel chapter 2 and 28 and 29? Joel 2, 28 and 29. Joel chapter 2, 28 and 29. That's one of those little books sandwiched towards the end of the Old Testament. It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out the Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and young men shall see visions, and upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my Spirit. Okay. So God said, In those days I will pour out my Spirit. Who did He say He would pour His Spirit out upon? Sons, daughters, all flesh. So God will pour out his spirit upon all flat flesh. And was he talking about just any time in history? No. He was talking about the end time. Those times, that time when perilous times will come, that great time when the great falling away would occur, that time when people would be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of of God, lovers of self more than lovers of God. They will be doing things that are right in their own eyes. This is the time when God's got to be pouring out His Spirit upon all flesh. But is all flesh going to? Re but are all of the flesh going to receive it? Is everyone going to receive it? No. Is the entire church world going to receive it? Is all the church world ready to receive it? No. But let's go back to um, John and Matthew. Jesus is the light of the world. And if Jesus is the light of the world, then the true Christian is the light of this world because Jesus is reflected upon them. That's who he's going to pour out his spirit upon. Now, if we go to Acts chapter 2, and I'll go ahead and read these verses. Acts chapter 2, we'll read 1 through 4, and then 14 through 18. 1 through 4, and 14 through 18. So in Acts chapter 2, this is the Pentecostal passage. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And they appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. What are we looking at here in Acts chapter 2, 1 through 4? We are looking at the birth of the church. Jesus Christ has gone away, and he said before to those that criticized him, my disciples don't have to fast. I'm still with them. They don't have to do any of that. But when, there's coming a time when I'll leave them, and they'll have to do these things for themselves. And then we get to Acts chapter 2, where he tells them to go and tarry, for the uh, coming of the Comforter, or the coming of the Holy Ghost. And this is exactly what we see. We are seeing the dawning of a new age in the church, for the church world, to, for a lack of better terms. But when we go down to verses 14 through 18, we find something interesting. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. 
For these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. So Peter's standing up in the middle of this whole thing to the spectators that are coming out and saying, let me tell you what's going on. Do you know what's going on here? Do you know what's going on here? When we get to verse seven, uh, 16, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet who? If it's one thing I love is when the Bible repeats itself, and especially when it repeats itself and it explains other passages. So here we get the explanation for Joel chapter 2. And it shall come to pass in the last days. When shall it come to pass? And when was the last days that Peter's prophesying about? Right then and there. We are, Peter's getting up and proclaiming that we are in the last days right here and right now. It has begun. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon how much flesh? Just some? All flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, and all my servants and all my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. So when we look at this, it has already begun. We are in the last days. And God has already started pouring out His Spirit upon all flesh. And it began at Pentecost. And when He said all flesh, He means all flesh. He doesn't mean just the men, but He means all flesh. What does Acts chapter 1 verses 12 through 14 state? Acts 1, 12 through 14. Acts 1, 12 through 14. And if you stumble through the names, it makes no difference. We're just getting to a point. Okay, I'll go ahead and read. Acts 1, 12 through 14. Then they returned unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come, they went into where? An upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zealots, and Judas the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with whom? The women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brethren. So when we're looking at this passage, it's just it's not just for one set. It's not just for one gender. It's not just for the men. It's not just for the sons and the daughters. It's not just for the old men that shall see visions, but or dream dreams, but it's for everyone. And who was in the upper room? Everyone that could possibly be there. Now it, we're straying again. But when we look at the command that Jesus told people to go and tarry until we send the comforter of the Father, it's a possibility that he told at least 500 people to go and wait for the promise of the Father. But how many people are in the upper room? The Bible states 120. How much of a difference is that from 500? A lot. It's only about four. The day and age we're living in, how many people do you think are really going to heaven? If we sat down and we looked at the church world, and it's not, it's not ours, I realize, to say who's going to get in and who's not. But if we had to judge, the Bible says, you shall know them by your fruits. I know that people cry, you can't judge, you can't judge. But realistically, when we look at the Word of God, it does say to judge. Try them by the Spirit. Uh, try them with the Spirit. Try the Spirit. Test their fruits. What do their fruits look like? Are they good or are they bad? Have something you're dealing with. They had the elders who used to sit on the front row and judge the tongues of interpretation to see if somebody was of uh, the devil saying something that wasn't 
but I wasn't being used. They were to try the spirits. So if we would look at the church world today, simply just judging by the fruits, and what they're teaching, and what they're preaching, and lining with the Word of God, how many churches are really preaching the Word of God? How many can we really say are following it? And when it comes to ministers, there are ministers that will preach it right down the line. But how many people come to church and they think that just because they're at church, God's got to take um, a roll call on a judgment day and say, yep, you did this evil deed, but you're at church, so it blots it out. There are people that are not living right in the churches. There are ministers who are not teaching right. It is all over the place. But guess what? You can't control what the minister teaches. You can't control what he preaches. You can control where you go. Just like the minister can't control what you do, where you go, or what you say. You are accountable to God. But out of 500 people, all I know is that 120 people showed up at Pentecost and received the baptism of the Holy Ghost with evidence of speaking in other tongues. If we relate that today's day and age, there's going to be very few people that get to heaven. There's going to be people that we think get to heaven, and we show up, and they're not there. There are going to be we think, people that we think are going to heaven, Brother Eli, and we're going to be surprised because they are there. How did you get here? But God is not a respecter of persons. And, but what he's looking for people who are willing to be the light of the world. And the only way we're going to be the light of the world is when we allow him to be reflected through us. And when we are willing to place ourselves in that situation, we also need to be willing that God can pour out his spirit upon us and use them the way he wants us to. God wants to move in ways that we could never dream or imagine. He wants to use us in ways that we could never dream or imagine. But you realize that there are lots of times that we cut God off from allowing him to use us to really be the light of the world. There are people that get the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking of other tongues. And they think, I got it. Now I can sit down. I don't need anything else. They don't pursue after the gifts of the Spirit. They don't say, God, use me in other ways. But Brother Eli, they reach that. They have reached their pinnacle right then and there. And I'm done. I can sit down. We have people that come to church that maybe they don't have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But God still can use them in other ways. But they come and they sit on their hands. We talked about that the other week. We talked about the gifts that God has given to the church, but we also talked about the gifts that God has given to you and how are you using them. But God wants to pour out His Spirit upon the church like never before. But those of us that have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, what are we doing with the Holy Ghost that we have now? What are we allowing Him to do through us? You know, so many times we get in our own comfort zone and that's it. Or God starts prompting us to step out of our comfort zone and go talk to so-and-so, you know what? I don't know about that. Or we start mumbling and thinking to ourselves, God, you better be, this better be you, because if not, I'm going to look like an idiot. <laughs> but what did God say? He would pour out his spirit upon all flesh. He's waiting for those individuals to make sure that they're ready to receive what he has for them. And when it comes to him pouring out his spirit upon all flesh, yes, he's referring to the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Yes, he's referring to wanting to give them a greater portion. Use them in ways that you could never dream or imagine. You realize that there's a point that almost sometimes we use the Holy Ghost as a novelty. It feels good to pray in the Holy Ghost, or it feels good to have Him flowing. Uh, maybe you can feel Him flowing in your stomach, or uh, flowing throughout your extremities as you're praying, and really getting in there. But that's not what the Holy Ghost is for. The Holy Ghost is to give us power to go out into the world and do a great work for God, to show them who God really is. We are the light of the world. We're not just to keep the Holy Ghost to ourselves, but we're to do something with Him. We, he has been given to us for a reason. To endue us with power from on high, to go out and do greater works than Jesus Christ has ever done. I realize I'm poor, but do you remember how many great works that God, Jesus Christ did throughout His ministry? What does the Word of God state concerning the works that Christ did? Do you remember What does John chapter 21 and 25 say? 
John chapter 21 and verse 25. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. 
Ephesians 1, 13 and 14.
But the Bible states that all of these things are for them that believe. <coughs> you shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Why should they recover? It's not because of anything special about you in the sense that we're just dust. Man has sinned. We've been born into a sin nature. What makes us special is the fact that Jesus Christ has forgiven us of our sins. He has bought us with the price. And now we are a new creature. And we have been given the earnest of our inheritance. And because of the earnest, now we can do greater things than Jesus. Amen. And we may not be... Uh, I don't want to go there, but still, there are things that we can do as long as we follow the Word of God. The Bible says, Ye shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. That's for everybody that believes. If you're living right, and somebody is sick, and they're saying, Oh, I'm not feeling well. Well, let's get you to the minister. No. Right then and there, if you've been living right, you can lay hands on the sick and see them recover. And not just the sick. Maybe somebody's had a leg amputated. And maybe you lay hands on them and you pray for them. God may bring that whole leg right back into existence. And you can watch it grow right before your eyes. Maybe somebody is blind and you can lay your hands on them. And you'll be the first person that they see. Not because that you're anything special of yourself, but because God's giving you a little bit of your inheritance right here and now through Jesus Christ. But we must make sure that we're living right. But it comes back to... What are we doing what's been given to us? The Bible states that you shall, if somebody is um, sick, you shall take them to the elders, and the elders shall um, lay, um, pray for them. You realize when it say, states elders, it's not the council member, it's not the deacons, it's not the pastor. But when you look at that and study it out, elders is just simply men and women full of faith. Men and women that believe that God can do this great thing. That's who it's talking about. And you don't need the baptism of the Holy Ghost for that to do, that to do that. You should want it. You should seek it. But there are things in the Word of God, because we have received the earnest of our inheritance, that we can go forth and face say, you know what? The Bible says, greater things than these shall ye do. And I have my inheritance. The Holy Ghost is, flow, is with me. And because of Him, I can do these things. But we must make sure that we are living right. We must make sure that we are truly God. That we are... I've shunned those evil things that we were once doing. We can't be living in sin and expect God to do great things through us. Will there be people that God do great things through that aren't living right? Absolutely. There'll be many on that day that say, Lord, Lord, have we not done this and have we not done that? There have been Catholic priests that have not been living right that have cast out devils only because they've been following the word of God. But man, we don't want to be in that boat. Because wide is the way that goes to destruction, but narrow is the way that leads to life. We want to make sure we're on that narrow path. And when we have found favor with God, who knows what great things God would do through us. But we need to make sure that we are living right. The Christians were first called Christians at Antioch because they were seen as little Christ. What does that mean? They were going about healing the sick. They were going about laying hands and praying for so-and-so. They were going out casting out devils. But, but why were they called little Christ? Because these were all the things that these people saw Christ do. So they didn't know how else to describe them. They're little Christ. They're mini means. They're doing exactly what he did. We are to be mini means. We are to be little Christ. That's what it means to be a Christian. What does Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13 state? Matthew 5, 13, and we're closing here. The church, ye are the light of the world. The church, ye are the salt of the world. And the Bible says, if the salt has lost its savor, what does that mean? Salt is a preservative. Salt is to help uh, make sure that something lasts forever or for a much longer time. We are the salt of the world. But if the salt has lost its savor, if the church is doing everything that the world is doing, what good are we? If we're showing Super Bowl Sunday just to try to get people in the church, what good is it? If we're having secular dances in the church just to try to draw all the young people in, what good is the church? We have lost our Savior. 
We have now gone from the narrow road, and we are on the broad path. The world is looking for the real thing. There are people in this world that are looking for the real thing. I read an article earlier in the year, or last year, or sometime, just recently, where the Bible said more and more people in the United States were turning, or millennials were turning to witchcraft because they felt like life was hopeless. There was nothing that they could do about it. But they found that when they cast spells and that kind of thing, they were taking things in their own hands and that they were feeling that now they could uh, help control their future. Where's the church in all of this? Witchcraft isn't going to save them. Witchcraft isn't the way to go. It's only going to make them more lost and take them into a much, much darker place. After 9-11... The churches were full. But some big newspaper article did a survey, and what they found was the reason that the people didn't stick in the churches and the reason they left, they didn't find anything there for them. They didn't find any help, any comfort. If the church has lost its savor, what good are we? Man, God has greater things in mind for us than we could ever dream or imagine. He wants us to get the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He wants to endure us with power from on high. He wants the young men to um, dream, uh, see visions and the old men dream dream. He wants to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. But are we in a position to allow him to do so? Greater things than these than Christ shall ye do. But we are we what are we doing with the Holy Ghost? Are we allowing him to work through us? You know. There's a uh, phrase that I think Paul Scherer stated it years and years ago. Don't quote me on it. But all it takes for evil to prevail is for good men to do nothing. If all we do is read our Bible, if all we do is come to church and sit on our hands, and we are truly born again Christians, we are saved, we've asked Jesus into our heart, and we stop doing those evil ways. If all we do are those things and we don't get proactive, we're already losing the war. If you don't realize one, anything else, to realize that we are in a real war with real spiritual consequences. And as long as the church world does nothing, as long as the church world is living like the rest of the world, we're of no good. And the devil is winning. And he's, we can pray for our family members all we want, but if we're not being pro proactive, we're already losing the battle. What are we doing with the Holy Ghost that we've been given? And with that, any thoughts, any questions? Otherwise, we're, right, we're closing. If not, let's bow our heads and prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and shall continue to do. Lord, we thank you that you're God who reigns on high and that there's none like you, Lord. Even right now, we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels at the four corners of the property above and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds will be in one mindset and one accord, that we may worship you in sincerity and truth, that the Holy Ghost may move as he so desires, Lord. Anoint the pastor as he brings forth the word today. Anoint his mind and his lips to bring forth your words. Anoint the song leader and the musicians as they praise you upon the string instruments, upon the vocal cords, Lord. As they lead us in songs, you'd have us to sing, Lord. I pray, Lord, that our hearts and our minds will be plowed, that they be good soil for your word to fall on, that we may remember it throughout the week. But even greater than that, that it would take root in our hearts, that we would apply it and be transformed into your very image even more, Lord. That we would increase our faith, Lord. That we would be stepped out even more. That we would desire to be men and women like Stephen, Lord. Men full of faith and full of the Holy Ghost, Lord. That we may win souls for your kingdom, that your kingdom may grow. That we may see greater things than Jesus did, not because of who we are, but because of who you are. We are living in tumultuous and dark times, Lord. Let us be that light in the middle of darkness that shines so bright that there's no way that anybody can deny it. And let us be that light that no one can snuff out. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.
your age list, you look the same. Beautiful, baby. Yes. Oh, it, it really is. Is God telling us what we need to do to be a effective church and to make it to heaven? Yeah. That's not very good, actually. I'm glad. Actually, you sound surprised. I just meant what <laughs> no, I, <know. laughs> I know.